You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. Sarah Gulseth is away today. She'll be back with us soon. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for your support of The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Uh, It's time for a little social studies lesson today, and joining us uh, from the Museum of the Bible, the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Kloa. He serves as Chief Curatorial Officer for the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Dr. Kloa, thanks so much for being our guest. Well, thanks for having me on. So, an exciting time, a great exhibit coming up uh, just around the corner here in July at Museum of the Bible. I want to talk about this, uh, about the Magna Carta. So, what is what is the history of the Magna Carta, and why is it important for us today? Well, the Magna Carta is one of the foundational documents in uh, human rights, the laws of really all Western countries, uh, not only England, uh, but also, of course, the United States, and really established uh, equality and justice as fundamental aspects of of, uh, Western countries overall, and has been uh, recognized as as essentially the founding document uh, that established a legal system. And in fact, uh, four of the clauses of the 1215 Magna Carta are still in force, if you will, in in the UK. So it's a it's a foundational document and and uh, really essential to American history as well. Mm. So it, it's an exhibit. Uh, it can be on exhibit at uh, the Museum of the Bible. So what's the relationship of the Magna Carta to the Bible? Yeah, it's uh, one of the things we try to do at Museum of the Bible is to show the impact of the Bible uh, to to all people, uh, especially in ways that they might not expect or realize. And, you know, so the Magna Carta, pretty much everybody at least has heard of it, but would probably not guess that uh, the Bible and the church had a role in defining and really even bringing about uh, the Magna Carta and its subsequent uh, impact on, on the world. And in particular, you know, the, so 1215, King John, you know, basically the, the worst uh, king in British history, I think is, is universally acknowledged, uh, spent a ton of money on wars in France and, you know, very unsuccessful, uh, made the church hate him, made the barons hate him. And finally, in 1215, kind of got cornered by the barons and the church and uh, was forced uh, to to sign this document. Um, it... Uh, it had a lot of influence. Uh, the, getting to that point in British history really was the result of some uh, anger, uh, really, of the church toward King John, which the barons then uh, kind of uh, hopped onto or joined in. And, uh, in fact, the first clause of Magna Carta, uh, again, most people probably don't realize this, the first clause of Magna Carta guarantees the freedom of the British church from the monarch. Uh, so, you know, the freedom of religion, in a sense, or, or the freedom of the church from interference from the state uh, was established in British law all the way back to 1215. And, of course, that became a part of uh, the American tradition and, uh, and and what we now have in America. Um, one of the key players in the whole episode in 1215 was a man named uh, Stephen Langton, who was the uh, Archbishop of Ca- uh, Canterbury at the time, the, the top position in England. And it seems pretty likely that he had a role in even writing parts of Magna Carta uh, in his uh, biblical commentaries. He's a, a pretty well-known biblical scholar from England at that time. Uh, in his biblical commentaries, he would quote passages from Deuteronomy and the Psalms, uh, explaining that the king uh, needed to follow God's laws and that the king should not lift himself up over the brothers. Uh, so there's there's certainly a, a, an indirect, uh, uh, if not sometimes direct, shaping of the language of Magna Carta and the themes of Magna Carta uh, that are consistent with, with uh, biblical and the church's teaching at the time. So there's there's a relationship to the Bible, and you you mentioned already that there's uh, certainly a connection to the church as well, to, particularly when it comes to um, the separation of church from the monarch. Any other connection mm-hmm. to the the church, the Magna Carta, and the English church at that time? Well, again, that was kind of one of the key issues: is uh, is the church uh, a spiritual estate, or is it subject to the to the crown? And, um, you know, that really was part of the uh, bargain, if you will, 
um, Langton had been uh, refused appointment by the King of England, in fact, a few years earlier, which is kind of what started the war with uh, the, the, the uh, um, unhappiness between the king and the church. And so, um, yeah, to establish that uh, right of the church to uh, appoint its leaders and its bishops and its teachings separate from the machinations of the crown was, was a pretty key, pretty key point at that time. So this exhibit is coming, I believe, in in early July. Tell us what we'll find in the Magna Carta exhibit at the Museum of the Bible. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a great exhibit, I think. Uh, we, um, we're we starting with the 1215 uh, story and uh, some really interesting objects coming over. Uh, we'll, we'll have in the exhibit uh, several things from the U.K., uh, first, uh, the only copy of a letter sent from Ronnie Mead Field in 1215, uh, where this agreement was signed, where King John tells basically all the um, counties that this agreement had been signed, that they should start, you know, kind of acting justly, and that the document would, would follow. Um, so we have the only copy of that coming, which is currently uh, housed at Hereford Cathedral. And then the copy of Magna Carta that is coming over is uh, the Hereford Cathedral uh, copy of Magna Carta, which is in, in beautiful condition, a uh, wonderful copy. Um, and that'll be kind of the main, uh, obviously, uh, you got to have a Magna Carta to do a Magna Carta exhibit. Uh, we've kind of made it fun by uh, having um, uh, portrayals of King John. So you see some video of King John with uh, period costume. In fact, uh, his costume is is made using 13th century methods. Uh, it's based on his uh, uh, burial effigy. Um, so it's bespoke and really fun. The actor that we have portraying King John in the exhibit is Andy Circus, who played Gollum in Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and Planet of the Apes. So pretty, pretty well-known actor and He's been very generous in uh, in this exhibit, um, and it'll the story will continue on. You know, we'll talk a bit about uh, how the impact of Magna Carta, uh, especially once we get to America, and and so a lot of objects from from our collection, from the museum's collection, will be in there. Uh, Magna Carta was was uh, printed. You know, symbols of Magna Carta was printed on colonial currency. Uh, it was referenced in the writings of the uh, uh, founding fathers of America. So we'll have some copies of like the Federalist Papers, uh, minutes of the Continental Congress from 1774. Um, Benjamin Franklin actually was part of the first printing of Magna Carta in America. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, a second copy of Magna Carta that we'll have in the exhibit is actually uh, for coming to the U.S. for the first time. And that's a 1300 copy uh, that is in Sandwich, England, which was actually seen personally by Thomas Paine, who's the author of Common Sense, kind of the uh, popular writing at the time of the revolution. Uh, Thomas Paine saw that copy, talks about it in 1759. So kind of coming a little bit full circle. And, uh, and so the impact of Magna Carta and individual rights, freedom of religion in America, uh, and, and then down around the world with the Universal Decl- Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so all that will be in the exhibit, a combination of uh, amazing artifacts that you can't see really anywhere else, um, a little bit of history, a little bit of showing how the Bible has, has played a role in these fundamental rights that we have, and a little bit of fun with, uh, you know, Andy Circus and medieval mm-hmm. swords and all that, you know, kind of stuff you'd like to see from the Middle Ages. Very good. Very good. Uh, How can we visit? I know this past year has certainly presented some challenges, um, and I know you you, you all have been doing a fantastic job of providing lots of ways to connect virtually and and keep up with exhibits going on at the Museum of the Bible. Um, Is the museum open for uh, in-person visits? Yeah, actually, we have uh, we've we've remained open uh, just a few short periods of uh, being closed. But um, in fact, uh, Washington, D.C. has lifted uh, pretty much all restrictions um, as far as uh, getting into uh, spaces and masks and all those kinds of things. So, yeah, come on out. The Smithsonian's are reopening. And um, uh, in fact, the last few days, we've seen uh, really nice numbers of people coming into the museum. So we're definitely open. Washington is open. Uh, it's a great time of year to come to D.C. 
We're opening Fourth of July weekend, uh, so uh, we'll have a, a public event on the first of July in the evening, which will be live streamed, and and you can hear some uh, amazing speakers about Magna Carta, and um, and then visit the exhibit beginning on July second, and it will stay at the museum through January third, so through the fall and uh, Christmas season, and uh, hope uh, hope a lot of people get to come out and see it. Very good. Very good. So, uh, plan a, a family trip this summer or this fall, and uh, come check out the Magna Carta exhibit at the Museum of the Bible. And I know there are so many other great things to see at the Museum of the Bible as well. For those who aren't familiar with the uh, the Museum of the Bible, can you just give us your maybe your your elevator speech? <laughs> elevator speech. Yeah, it's uh, it's the the largest and uh, most technologically advanced museum in the world that's focused on the Bible. Um, we have uh, about 3,200 artifacts on display that focus on the history of the Bible, uh, the stories of the Bible, and the impact of the Bible in America and around the world. And we do so in a very uh, interactive, engaging, uh, multi-sensory approach. Uh, it's a great experience for kids and families, a lot of activities for kids to do. Um, uh, virtual reality kind of things, a really popular multimedia walkthrough. It's hard to kind of describe, just kind of have to do it, <laughs> of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, we've won awards for it. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place with some amazing uh, examples of the history of the Bible. We have a exhibit of uh, archaeology from the Israel Antiquities Authority. Uh, that's a long-term exhibit, an exhibit from the Vatican Museum and Library. And uh, so some really unique things that you can't see anywhere else. And again, all focused on a pretty amazing book that's uh, had such an impact on many, many people and, and cultures around the world. Indeed, indeed. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Kloa. He's Chief Curatorial Officer for the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Dr. Kloa, thanks so much for being my guest today on the Coffee Hour. Well, thanks. Hope you get to come out to D.C. That would be fantastic. You're listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. 